Great. So we can chat amongst ourselves here. It looks like we still got a few people coming in. And then for those of you listed on recording, you'll want to go forward a little minute or two. We start. I don't know if, uh, Patrick, if you want to put it in a uh, slideshow mode now. Yes, I thought it was. Um, I'm, I'm seeing all the different charts. I'm not seeing just one. Are you seeing it now? Uh, not yet. Let me, I'll stop sharing and then I'll reshare it. Okay. Uh, that, nope. It's still in. Okay. <laughs> it, we'll, fig we'll figure it out real quick. We will. There's always something. There's always something. There we go. That looks good. Okay, cool. Is it a okay. full screen for you? It is full screen. Beautiful okay. blue background. Okay, okay. Well, why, don't we, why don't we get rolling here since it's uh, four after the hour here. So thanks everybody for uh, joining either today live uh, Thursday or on the recording here. Uh, this is something at the end of the year, we're glad to have the folks from uh, BIDA, Blockchain and Transport Alliance uh, joining us to share their thoughts on in what their plans are for 2021. Uh, BIDA is a uh, key player in standards. They also provide a lot of thought leadership on the supply chain world. So that's why we asked them to come on and share um, a little bit of what, again, what their thoughts are, what their plans are. Uh, Patrick uh, Duffy and Ben Katari are going to be speaking with us. Uh, Patrick is the president of BIDA, so he's involved with lots of different things. And then Patrick and Ben, I'll let you also add on anything else that you'd like to in terms of your introduction. And Ben, I know Ben from the uh, Shipman Working Group. Ben has been the Massive leader. He's really kept us all rock and rolling here in 2020. Uh, and, and I found out that Ben's also doing a lot more work uh, with BIDA. So between them, they can answer a lot of questions as well as provide a lot of insight as to what's going on uh, with Blockchain Transport Alliance and standards specifically uh, ask them to focus on. So with that, uh, Patrick, I'll turn it over to you and we can get rock and rolling. Yeah, awesome. Thanks so much for having me, Tom. Um, I'm sorry, Marco wasn't going to be able to, to join us today, but I do see a number of familiar uh, names, if not faces, across the participants um, list. This is the second time um, I've been privileged enough to be invited to present to the Hyperledger um, Supply Chain Special Interest Group. So thank you guys so much for having me back. Um, we're going to dive into some more of the technical details this time around. Um, and as Tom said, I'm excited to invite Ben to talk through some of those specifics. So um, just gonna make sure you guys can still see my screen. We can see your screen. Perfect, well then I'm gonna kick things off. Or at least so. I can see your screen, how's that? <laughs> there you go. And so uh, like my previous presentation, I still try to frame all of this up around the digitization of freight and transportation. And so as everyone knows, um, there's probably never been a time where supply chain has been more relevant um, than 2020. It's really come home to roost how interconnected the world has become and how dependent we are um, on the orchestration of lots of stakeholders to provide for everything from uh, essentials like toilet paper um, all the way to the, the massive um, undertaking around the COVID-19 uh, vaccine distribution plans, which are coming together. Uh, really swiftly. And so we're really excited about the work we're doing at BIDA because it's taking all of these legacy and analog processes and basically allowing for um, really high fidelity data elements to provide for these transformational business model shifts, um, really allowing for that multi-party collaborative arrangements that are, uh, that are driving the unlocking of, of sometimes hidden or obscured value opportunities. Um, so Blockchain is a lot of things to a lot of different people, but I think that's really the important part. It's around that multi-party collaborative arrangements um, and, and how that's unlocking uh, new opportunities. So as I said, there's kind of two dirty D words, uh, digitization and disruption. Um, and as we move from these analog and legacy processes, 
Uh, we think that there's going to be industry-wide benefits, um, but you know that also is going to shake up uh, uh, incumbent stakeholders. And I don't think that it's going to be a, a destruction of uh, the middleman that you know was uh, kind of the common thread around how blockchain technology or DLT more broadly was going to uh, impact uh, different stakeholders when the technology really started spinning up. I do think that it's going to bring about um, new value propositions and shifting of uh, stakeholders' roles. So that that being said, you know, Bita came together in the summer of 2017, really kicked off its standards efforts in 2018. Um, as a member-driven community focused on education, evangelism, and working towards um, open source and royalty-free data standards that we think are going to power this blockchain-enabled uh, ecosystem, particularly around supply chain and transportation business processes. Um, so the BIDA community uh, is far and wide. Uh, since its inception, um, you know, we've had well over 2,000 companies from around the globe um, uh, uh, submit inquiries around membership. Um, actual actual members and, and contributors to the standards development work um, have ranged from um, small academics and researchers all the way up to the world's biggest um, technology providers and actual physical asset owners, the transportation providers that actually move um, the atoms and not just the bits. So it's really exciting to bring together such a diverse community um, representing every transport mode um, and, and stakeholders from around the globe to collaboratively build out these solutions um, that we see coming much faster than I think everybody uh, really realized um, they'd be, be here. Um, so like I said, uh, BIT has kind of got two sides of the community. We've got kind of the community that's focused on uh, evangelism and networking and education. And then the, the, the meat of the, the situation is really around the production of these open source and royalty free data standards. And you know, we, we do this as a community um, focused on, on inclusion and transparency to build that trust in our work products that we think will uh, allow it to, to really be globally adopted. So all of the work around the standards committee is governed by one of two technical committees. Um, to date, all of the work has been governed by the data formats technical committee that reports up to the board, um, the board of directors, which ratifies and publishes out all of the specifications under an Apache 2.0 open source license structure. This new implementation technical committee, um, I'm really excited about. It's going to, for the first time, push us into um, trying to address the really hard questions about, you know, what data goes on chain, what are the right or uh, best practices around reference architecture, and I think we've set this up in a really exciting way that's going to maintain the technology agnostic stance that BIT has always really strived for. So I'm excited about where that's going. Um, and that's going to be the, the real exciting work in 2021 that's going to allow us to leverage the, the power of our community um, to flesh out use cases and see the use of these data elements um, that have been produced to date um, in, in action, uh, really driving time to value um, and allowing for that uh, orchestration uh, of um, identities in, in supply chain. Uh, information uh, for different types of stakeholders, whether those are the um, end users, consumers, or uh, asset uh, providers that are actually allowing for the movement of the goods, um, or different service providers, whether those are financial institutions, insurers, um, or regulatory bodies like customs agencies, DHS, DBP, um, et cetera. So I'm excited about where it's going. Um, everybody wants standards um, to happen. Um, you can really only move at the pace of the community. So I'm really excited about um, what the, the groundwork we've laid over the past two years that's going to see us move into this next chapter. So the, the working groups that have been building out specifications include uh, tracking documentation, location, party, shipment, um, and all of that kind of works towards these work products around a bill of lading. Um, we also have a standards review working group that um, helps us uh, figure out what other standards are out there that we need to make sure that we're aware of and help drive collaborative conversations um, with leading standards bodies. We don't want to boil the ocean. We know this isn't something that we can do independently. Um, collaboration is absolutely essential um, to drive this work, um, particularly because it's global in nature and is responsible 
um, for multi uh, transport mode work. The handoff between different types of stakeholders, I think, is really becoming apparent as the consumerization of visibility technology has gotten down to our iPhones. Everybody wants to have the same type of visibility um, that we now have through Uber or Lyft delivering our late night snack that we want around an ocean container or a rail car or a, 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 a parcel that now has a sensor inside of it. So we're really excited about where it's going. We've outlined a number of work groups that we are planning um, to either spin up shortly um, or are working on the chartering of them. One of the ones I'm really excited around is this purchase order for the Consigny. Um, I've had some really exciting conversations with outside organizations um, like the International Chamber of Commerce around the need for this. And um, I think that it's really gonna uh, help capture um, those, those Genesis data blocks that help waterfall all of our other data elements providing for um, the answers that we're looking for in these solutions. So this is kind of an early um, model around how we were looking at the different classes of data, how they would come together to address that question, where is my stuff? You know, the, the uh, foundational supply chain visibility questions. And that's what we really honed in on in 2018 as we spun up these work groups to address um, traditional track and trace visibility functions. Um, and this work has spurred us down a number of different developments. And, uh, it's definitely been an iterative process and an evolution that's got us to this point. Um, you know, the, the standards development process is particularly challenging. Um, we, we, re we leverage this idea around co-opetition where we're bringing together stakeholders um, that are sometimes fierce competitors that would otherwise not want to be um, working in the same room with one another, sharing insights about how they're approaching um, their data structures, um, how they're, they're working with um, uh, other stakeholders as they move goods between a uh, point of production and consumption, and sometimes even in reverse logistics situations. Um, the, the points to take away are, is what I was saying. You can only move as fast as the community. Um, there, there's challenges um, that we have identified and we've been working through. Um, between the, the actual consumables of what we're trying to produce, the personas of those uh, consumers, whether they're business role uh, type uh, professionals or whether they're more technical professionals. Um, and that also drives uh, the contribution uh, to the standards development efforts. And it's really uh, been enlightening because I think it's really important to bring together both of those personas um, you can have a, a world-class uh, architect, but if it's not addressing the, the crucial business need uh, in a way that um, actually can get a budgetary sign-off, you know, it, it's really kind of spinning our, our tires. So I think it's really been powerful, the community we've brought together, um, but it's also illuminated some real challenges and opportunities in the marketplace to develop um, new solutions. Um, and one of those areas that's really been uh, brought to light is the need for multi-role, multi-work group collaborative uh, platforms to drive this work uh, forward effectively. Um, and I think most people would be familiar with a platform like GitHub and GitHub is incredible in the way that it has democratized the ability um, for developers around the world to gain access to world-class thought leadership and also contribute to that. But there are challenges with on the market solutions. Um, and I'm really excited uh, and happy to have been here today to talk about how we're working to implement a solution that I think is really going to accelerate and drive participation and engagement, not only from internal uh, stakeholders from across the bit of community, but also with external standards bodies and other industry participants and regulators from around the, uh, around the world that are really going to need to have an understanding of what we're working on and, and participate as we move forward. Um, so with that, I'm gonna Andrew, uh, hand it over. Can I ask a question there real fast? Yeah, Just yeah, please. We have, uh, some folks that work at big companies, some folks that work at small companies, since you're talking about the standards process and can you talk a little bit about, hey, are we looking for folks with only big company experience or are we looking for startups to help with the standards process? Uh, th thanks for that question, Tom. Um, no, uh, it, it's really, we, we want as many excited folks that have um, talent and understanding of these pain points to contribute to the solutions. 
And that's a really important part of, of my role. And it's been an expanding part of my role um, is making sure that we are having the right conversations with the right stakeholders from around the globe. And I, I see a number of, of those stakeholders actually in the participant list um, today. So I'm excited that um, we, we are working together to try to address this. But everybody from, um, you know, uh, I've had high schoolers reach out that have been interested in, in, in trying to solve some of these challenges um, all the way to um, C-level executives at some of the world's largest enterprises. There's a real excitement right now. And I think we're at an inflection point where the technology is meeting um, a, a use case. Um, and I'm not gonna dive too much into it because I really wanna spend some time uh, allowing Ben to kind of work through yeah. our, our work. But I really think that the technology is getting to a point where it's not the biggest hurdle. Right now, there's a real um, need to make sure that we proper, properly uh, educate and illuminate the solutions and capabilities that are out there to regulators, because I think there's this regulatory uncertainty, not only in the United States, but at a global level that is um, slowing down the ability to really take this to an ecosystem level. And so I'm excited and encouraged by a number of projects that are out there um, where you're starting to see cross-border applications of this technology driving uh, real time to value. Um, so I'm excited about that, but I'm going to hand it over to Ben. Ben, do you want me to stop sharing my screen so you can take over? Thank you, Patrick. Yes, if you could, please. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing and you go. And we can see your slide uh, 15. Yep. Perfect. All right. Um, so, um, Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Ben Patari. Uh, basically, um, I'm entrepreneur at heart. This is my third venture, AccuWise. And uh, we've been involved with BIDAS from the day one, um, even before BIDAS itself was conceived as a name. And what I'll do is I'll quickly go through some of the work that has happened. What you saw was more a high level setup, but I'm going to get a little bit more into the the nitty gritties of it. So you kind of get a flavor of what, what it looks like to develop standards uh, within BIDA's work group. So having said that, um, essentially um, we have been involved in multiple work groups. So the very first work group that came out of BIDA's was the, uh, the one on the tracking document work group. We have a uh, sort of a quasi standard already published and it's available on the BIDA studio site if you want to download and review it. Um, I'm currently working and sharing the shipment work group. That's where the, I would say the, the focal point is right now. And then we have also been deeply involved in, in the location party and bill of lading uh, work groups as well. So essentially when we started looking at how, I mean, supply chain is a very broad topic. And within that broad topic itself, you have, even if we just talk about logistics and transportation that in and of itself is, is a fair, fairly broad trop topic. So really we kind of started looking into it. What are the use cases? What are the areas that we feel we want to start focusing on first? So essentially that basically what led us to into building um, sort of this as a, a model that we are after, right? So what you have on the very left are the orders um, that are coming in. Those orders obviously um, get combined with all kinds of master data in terms of location, parties, equipment. And then you obviously have the routes and itineraries and the service rates. And, and, and essentially when you plan and optimize what you get out of it is a shipment. And this is where we're focusing on um, right now in this work group, but there are additional work groups working on location and party and, and equipment is will be spun by itself. And essentially trying to do a track and trace across that entire transportation logistics chain is really where our focus is in terms of, um, as Patrick mentioned, you know, bill of leading or, or trackable events. Um, that's what we're really after. So that's where our involvement is. Now, um, what we have released so far, when we first initially started out, uh, we actually started out doing the traditional way of how things were done. like. Uh, majority of our documentation was basically a word document with tabular structures with UML diagrams and 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 you know the the, the data formats defined in um, 
in, in UML and so on, then we, we would communicate through the Slack channels and our information will be kept in GitHub or some of it on Swagger Hub. And we very quickly realize uh, that when we're working in a multi-work group and a, and a multi-role collaborative scenario, uh, that type of a paradigm doesn't really scale well, especially if you're dealing with people from varying different skills from technical to business, from executives to pretty much anybody in between. So essentially what we ended up doing was while we were also innovating on the standard side, we actually also built a platform, which is what I'm gonna uh, demo right now. And as you're seeing the platform, you'll also see what the standards look like. And those standards are completely all um, open API v3 uh, compliant standards now. Um, we started out early on uh, with looking at a lot of different formats, but that's what really we standardize on. And pretty much everybody is moving over this way. So I don't think this would come as any surprise to anyone. So having said that, let me just- ben, just to be clear, this is across all of bid is going to open API. That is correct, yeah. So we, we had a lot of discussions and debate. What is the best way to represent our standards and formats? Is it JSON TLD? Is it XML, XSDs, UML, you name it, right? But this is what we have standardized on as being our mechanism going forward across all the groups. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. So essentially what I'm gonna demo now is we'll solve both those purposes, right? You will actually see some of the standards in action. Then you'll also see what that collaborative process looks like. So um, I'm actually on the AccuI side and let me just make sure I'm logged in. And as you can see, we have various different work groups that are defined. And if you look at the location one, this is by far the one which has been uh, talked about the most because this is the very first one that we released, right? So essentially, if you look at the model, um, essentially, this is what a specification, I'm giving you a concrete example of what a specification really looks like, right? It's got a um, introduction, scope, acknowledgements, that type of section. But if you really look at the model itself, the entire model location is defined within the UML format. I'm sorry, in the UML format up here, but the actual model itself is the open API specification. So what you see here is the actual open API specification. This is nothing proprietary. What I mean by that is uh, what you're seeing here is the actual specification, but behind the specification you would see is the actual YAML file. Uh, so those of you technically, this is, you could literally take this YAML file, download it, um, and you can start implementing uh, your location model if you would like um, using this componentry right here. So essentially it's a platform that allows you to build uh, uh, your, your models and your specifications in, in a highly visual and an open API v3 format. And as you go and edit those, these models, um, you, can, you can go and commit your changes and those changes are then stored in the GitHub repository. So essentially what this is giving us is a platform uh, for us to be able to collaborate um, as Patrick and Tom were mentioning across a wide variety of audiences. Because if I show somebody who comes from operations or somebody who comes from a non-technical background, this type of syntax, it becomes very difficult for them to understand really what's happening. But if I switch over and we start talking in terms of really what the data attributes are, or what the use cases, what the requirements are, they're able to comprehend and contribute much, much better. And they do not have to be, that's the key point I'm trying to stress. They do not have to be technical at all to be able to uh, contribute. Uh, but what we get the end product out of it is 100% open API compliance. So essentially anybody who wants to take it and implement it is then able to do that. So um, so that's, that's the key um, uh, sort of direction we're heading. And the reason we invested time and, and energy in this platform, even though we know there's Swagger Hub and there's a bunch of other stuff out there, but they all tend to be in technical domain. And what we're trying to do at Bidas, and this is a very, very key point, because we're actually working very closely with TradeLens. We also have a few interaction with, with GS1. And we're trying to see whatever is already out there and make sense, let's not try to reinvent the wheel, whether it is the UN CPAC standards, MMT standards, um, or other standards. So like, for example, if I were to give you a glimpse of what the actual 
uh, trade lens model looks like. So this is the actual trade lens model, right? And so if you look in the trade lens model, they actually also have address defined. This is how they define address. This is their definition of address uh, within the trade lens model. Um, and essentially now there's no reason for us to reinvent this wheel if we can just reuse this right there. So essentially what when we invented, when we created a location, we obviously had a location, but we did a little bit um, more in terms of location in the sense that we do uh, have the same address components but for us, location is also about creating a geo hierarchy or you, actually we capture the information like latitude, lo longitudes and altitude, plus location is a recursive structure by itself. And what I mean by that is location is an array of location itself. Um, and so, so this is more hierarchical, but when it comes to the actual address attributes, we just did as a reference as a, a to, to that data model. So you can start kind of getting a glimpse of what we are trying to do. We're not trying to reinvent everything. If something already exists, it's good, it's out there, we would leverage it, but then we will extend it in a manner so that uh, we can have as much compatibility as possible across the already existing standards, or in some cases, just adopt them verbatim. There's no reason to reinvent them. So hopefully that kind of gives you a little bit of flavor of the type of work um, that we're doing as at, at beta. So I, I can go more into a specific specification. So like, for example, this is our location party. We have defined a complete common vocabulary and a data model as well in terms of the very common uh, components that are needed across all the work groups. When we talk about, you know, the, the climate measurement or dimension measurement or hazardous material or, or seals and signatures, trackable entities, weight measures, these are components that are re leveraged and used across pretty much all the different word groups that are out there. So they're, they're kind of becoming part of our common vocabulary. And um, these components are not necessarily even just tied down to uh, a logistic domain, for example. These can be used across a wide variety of use cases and, and domains uh, because they are common uh, data structures that can be leveraged and referenced. So, so that, that would be an example of that. Good. Ben, are you okay for a question right now from Brett? Yeah, absolutely. Brett, go ahead. Hi, my name is Brett Carpenter, and I'm in um, uh, Rochester, Michigan. And what we're proving up in our in our technology platform has to do with map nodes and parse trees. Is there any consideration with regards to your location? Um, treatments and methods in your engineering pursuits about map nodes and connecting the real world to, you know, to, to the location itself? So, I mean, we, we have talked location from the point of view of, you know, like um, addressability and geo coordinates and, and, and split um, uh, codes from, from railroad station, those type of things, but specifically map nodes, no. Um, we, we did have conversations around uh, mapping uh, polygons of locations as well, but this would be an example where, you know, someone like you could come in, provide that type of input, and then we can see how it really impacts the location standard or, or what the next rev of location Definitely. can be Definitely. used to um, extend it. Yep. Yeah, thanks, Brett. Uh, I'll, I'd love to follow up with you and figure out how we can learn a little bit more about that. Absolutely, absolutely. Good. Brett, Ben, where do you want to take us next? Um, so I think that's pretty much what I had to share. Obviously, uh, if uh, you, you're, you're interested, um, you know, please join us in these work groups. If you have questions, you can go through the forum section and uh, post questions, or if you have any other ideas that you would want to talk about, you can go and submit your ideas um, and they can be taken upon as additional work groups either to be spawned or maybe facilitated within the existing work groups. I think there's there's a lot more work needs to be done. So uh, uh, more we can get in, involved, the better it is. So that's pretty much all I had to share for now, but uh, I'm open to Q&A if you'd like. And so I have one quick question here. 
Was there a link in the charts where somebody could go to open API and see what standards are already out there published? Um, I mean, it's certainly on recording here, but is there some place we could rattle off for folks? Yeah, so uh, bira.studio is the main site, right? And if you go on standards, you can, we, we have only released uh, uh, one, one standard, which was the, this one right here. And then what we are working on is this track and trace one uh, right here. But this is, this is how we were doing things in the older ways. But now all of our standards, again, this is a TBD, uh, early next year, uh, it'll be released out, but it, all of our standards will now be available online in the format uh, that I just talked about or showed um, on the online platform itself. And you would be able to download all the YAML files and what have you um, uh, from that platform. So um, that is that is coming um, as we speak. But so essentially- watch this space. Go to bit, yes. watch bit.studio. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you can register and you can start looking at some of the stuff that's in here. So you would just go in here, click on register. And there are there are two ways you can register. You could just use your existing Facebook or uh, Twitter or Gmail ID and just log right in. Um, now you may not have all the permissions, uh, but if you send the permissions at certain work groups, you will get those. Or you can fill this form and provide your interest in some of the work groups that you're interested in. And we can, we can get that information that way as well. So, uh, but this is, uh, yet to be fully released, we're transitioning, like I said, more from a yeah. old style of doing things where we would just create a bunch of Word documents and put them on Google Drive or communicate via Slack or GitHub. We're moving away from that and we're kind of creating this, a, 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 a collaborative platform, so to speak, for us to be able to um, do things a little bit more efficiently in, in, in a global setup. But you're welcome to join and you're welcome to, like I said, provide your feedback, your comments, those all sections. And um, that's definitely is the direction we're moving towards. Great, thanks, Ben. And I think Ben hit upon a, a really important point, um, you know, saying that it's really a global community. And so by moving to that open API v3 documentation that has the human readable element and then the underlying YAML file, it removes the uh, fuzziness around understanding what we're, we're saying. So that particularly when, when you have consumers in the global environment, there's not multiple, multiple translations of the underlying data elements because what's documented there in, in English at the moment has that underlying YAML structure that can be consumed machine to machine. That, that's great because we have a lot of members who are outside the U.S. who will probably listen to this on recording. So that's that's good to point out. Thanks, Patrick. Yeah, awesome. Okay, uh, any questions out there from the audience? Other thoughts? So we got a question coming in from Sonali. Uh, it says, can you elaborate on AI enabled projects for secured supply chain? Ben, do you wanna talk a little bit about, uh, about um, your thoughts on that topic. I know, I know you've had a lot of uh, time to consider the implications there. Yes, so no, that's, that's a very broad topic, right? So essentially, like I said, when we started out, we really started out looking at problems from the point of view of uh, transportation and logistics. And even to get kind of to the next level of it, different uh, modes of transportation, right? Uh, marine and air and railroad and what have you. And then trying to build a, a sort of a, a architecture uh, um, around what would that multimodal architecture look like? And what are some of the standards that we can develop around that architecture to even solve simple problems of you know, end-to-end -end, uh, visibility or track or trace and, um, and or even chain of custody type scenarios, right? But once you have that platform, once you have that underlying layer available to you, there are a lot of different um, AI use cases that can be enabled. AI use cases as in trying to figure out uh, or predicting where might be risk or delays uh, within my network uh, for, for goods to be moved uh, to a end destination, building productive models around that. Or for example, if you're dealing with 
um, more around machineries or, or, or equipment, trying to figure out their maintenance schedules and being able to do predict, then you can use that equipment data standard and then kind of use that as a component to build your um, AI ML models on top of those. So as of right now, we do not, we haven't built any, um, I, I guess we we're building the, I guess the underlying plumbing, so to speak. We haven't really built the AI models itself, but the fact that if there is a standard, because um, my background is actually AI, I can, I can talk at a length um, uh, in, in a separate conversation. But when we started looking at blockchain and AI and, um, and, and, and some of the other technologies uh, almost two or three years ago, uh, uh, for it to all make sense, uh, there was a need for uh, standardization of underlying layer, underlying plumbing, if you, if you will, right? In terms of what are those components that are needed in terms of equipment, in terms of location, in terms of party, in terms of shipment, ship units, handling units. Um, those are the building blocks that are needed. Um, either, obviously, the you can do the traditional approach, which is try to build an integration into 20, 30, 40 different systems in an in a end-to-end fashion, or you could agree on some form of standardization, and that standardization then kind of becomes as your input building block into building your, um, your, your machine learning uh, models, right? Predictive models um, and, and so on. So essentially what I'm saying is list of uh, the key drivers that are needed uh, for, for you to be able to, whether it's multivariate or single variate, uh, those components no longer have to be proprietary. Those components can be derived off of these models. Great, Great. thank you, Ben. Thanks, Ben. Patrick, you want to talk maybe a little bit about uh, futures and what's coming in 2021 and how people can start actually using some of the standards and all the great work that's happening. Yeah, Ben, do you want to stop sharing your screen and I'll go back to the deck and I'll just, just run through that because it covers a couple of the different topics. Okay. Dun, dun, dun. Oh. Um, sorry, I opened the wrong thing again. There we go. I'm seeing, I'm so, seeing full screen here. Okay, can you see it now? Oh, maybe. I just lost go. it. Can y'all see there this? There we go. Despite initial reluctance, yep. Okay, so I, I love to use this slide and it's, a, it's, it's kind of the, the needle popping the, the bubble. Um, this was, this was done in 2017 by the IBM Institute for Business Value Analysis. And I think what it demonstrates is the, the expectation around the speed of implementation versus the challenges when the rubber hits the road and you really start seeing what, are, what it takes to get there. And so this is showing um, first wave industries expectations around the adoption of this technology over a time period of four years between 2017 and 2021 uh, with, with half of uh, first wave industries um, that's defined somewhere else saying that by um, 2019, you know, half the marketplace would be working on that. When you overlay or overlay the transportation industry by 2020, and we're getting towards the end of this uh, bell curve going into 2021, they were expecting, you know, based off of their survey results, that most of the marketplace within the transportation industry would not only be uh, experimenting with this technology, but would have embraced it and, and started to, to leverage it. And anecdotally, I think that there's some really exciting projects out there. But you know, when when you look at the real facts, we're a far way away from any any sort of adoption of production level projects, um, particularly at an industry and ecosystem level. So, you know, all of that being said, you know, when you step back and kind of look at the uh, space station view of what all this means, um, you know, we're in the early stages of this. Um, it was trying to figure out, you know, how to educate industry participants um, outside of just the implications for cryptocurrency initially. Um, figuring out where are standards that can be leveraged that currently exist, what standards need to be derived, um, and then starting to build those collaborative relationships 
not only with other standards organizations, but with stakeholders within supply chain and transportation operations. And um, you know, that's something that, that BIDA has really um, excelled at is bringing together that global community, everybody from BP to Salesforce, who's looking at how to leverage this technology to move forward. Um, I think that this kind of final point right here on regulatory authorities developing auditing and compliance practices, that's still really fuzzy. I mean, in the US, the SEC is doing some interesting things. Um, DHS and Homeland Security more broadly has some really interesting initiatives um, that, I, that I hope we'll, we'll see the actual fruit of. Um, it's certainly a, a great technology to leverage there. Um, but I think we're really just getting into this growth phase now. Um, where you're going to see these meaningful projects starting to roll out that showcase the value of um, innovative data governance models that are allowing for these business model transformations. And that's really going to drive that, um, that growth around this space, um, but slower than what most people think. Um, you know, the, 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 there's certainly a marketplace for... Um, uh, insight reports and um, consulting projects, but it's really um, challenging but exciting when you start getting the the people that hold the the budgetary strings of these global organizations that are looking at how to implement this technology over you know in in a in a series of kind of order of operations conversations to get there, and, and so I think. You know, we'll see meaningful global projects emerge um, over the next three to five years in a, in a very serious way. And you're starting to see that now. And so, you know, from 2017 to 2019, there was a real focus around the technology, you know, uh, bespoke integrations going live. There was, you know, trying to figure out what standards are out there. Um, and of course, you know, the way that IoT was going to play into everything, standards around IoT still, you know, we're, there's some work there. 2020, 2020 is around now. And I think it's not so much about the technology. You know, there was a real challenge around interoperability and interoperability, I think with projects like Polkadot, um, you're starting to see that interoperability challenge starting to be solved for in a really exciting way. Um, so allow, this is allowing for real business use cases to bubble up to the surface. And one of the exciting things about the work that we've done at BIDA is that it's stretching that visibility backwards into the supply chain in a way that um, just previously hasn't been widely available. And so I'm excited about where that's going. Um, but you know, global organizations are certainly meaningfully implementing projects at a production level. Um, these are just projects that have been highlighted over the second half of 2020. Um, you know, global organizations um, that are really excited about what this means and are taking a proactive step to make sure that they are building out um, the technology stacks and the professional capabilities within their organizations to serve um, their constituents moving forward. Um, you know, everybody from uh, Alibaba and, and, and Financial, Cisco, uh, Salesforce, the Class 1 railroads, the automakers, there's a, a seemingly endless supply of really exciting um, applications for this technology that are, as I alluded to at the beginning, kind of unlocking these obscure areas where value can be recaptured. Um, and, and I think that's kind of the, the, the underlying point is that when you can recapture that value from inefficiencies, you can put it towards much more exciting and, you know, frankly, uh, fun kind of uh, projects, and, and that's where you know people can get excited. But the the standards component remains a crucial piece. Um, a number of great organizations are doing really powerful work. Um, just this past week, the Digital Container Shipping Association pushed out a standard around electronic bill of lading in the maritime space. Um, the Interwork Alliance has been doing some great work with two tokens that's connecting uh, the port of Singapore. And I think it's the port of Rotterdam. I always confuse it and I apologize for anybody. You got it. The project. <laughs> um, and, and that's been really exciting work around bill of lading as well. Um, but it reinforces the regulatory challenges that exist in different geographies. In Singapore, where you know they can work with a, a very progressive all bite uh, controlled power structure, when something works really well, they can adopt it. 
But when those physical atoms get to the other side of that supply chain move after, you know, two weeks on the ocean and they land in Rotterdam, there's, you know, 2000 years of trade precedent and six layers of administration that this system has to work for. And so it, it's exciting, but um, it, it's certainly illuminating certain challenges that are going to need to be solved for. And, and that can only really be done by bringing together the right uh, people to have those conversations with. And then when you're having those conversations, using a shared um, ontology or a, sh a shared language about what this means. Um, this was something that was, I, know, I didn't realize would be such an issue, but when the, the standards efforts really started kicking off, just defining what location would mean or what shipment means um, and making sure that that's a very clear definition um, that can be utilized around the globe for every transport mode. Um, is really, really important. And so all of that, you know, being said, we're working really hard. Um, I'm having really exciting conversations with the leadership at standards organizations around the globe to make sure that we are framing up the next steps uh, in a really powerful um, and effective, I think maybe more crucially in an effective way so that we can have these globally meaningful conversations it's great to have, you know, one-on-one -on -one conversations with your uh, congressmen or, uh, or, or representatives in Congress, but, you know, this is a global situation. We're talking, you know, the World Trade Organization, the World Customs Organization. Um, it, everybody is, is going to need to at least have a, a very solid understanding, if not buy-in to these types of systems. And, um, you know, stepping back, that's quite an audacious role to take on. Um, but, but I think that there's, there's a real um, value proposition to seeing this through. But it's not going to be a two or uh, a three year project. This is going to be an ongoing iterative project that's going to uh, take the, the contributions of everybody from individual researchers um, to governmental entities. And so, um, you know, as Ben said, certainly invite all of y'all to, to reach out, get involved, um, ask the executives at your company, what are y'all thinking about this technology and how it can, can play a role for your organization's uh, uh, path forward. And um, we'd love to, to have conversations with y'all and get y'all involved, um, particularly as we're moving into the implementation phase. Um, the expertise of professionals that have worked on the Hyperledger platforms are really important. They're, they're being really, uh, they're, they're well adopted. There's a, a large body of work that we can learn from um, and, and we'd like to make sure that we utilize uh, that knowledge set uh, moving forward. So all of that kind of being said, I know we're running up about 10 minutes left. Um, you know, just maybe open it back up for conversation points or discussions. Um, Tom, I'll let you take it. Great, thanks Patrick, thanks Ben. Uh, for things, any other questions out there from the uh, crowd? Maybe one question to kind of set something up. I mean, you see a lot of work around uh, in supply chain around control towers. Um, maybe if you could distinguish where you think the work that Ben is leading could help or maybe complement what's going on with control towers or maybe could be something that is kind of a better future than control towers. Yeah, um, I think that's, that's a great point and something that Ben alluded to, and maybe I'll let Ben talk a little bit more about it. Um, but I guess my, my point is, is that Bita is not going to build a product. Bita is really building that orchestration layer for the data elements that are gonna power these types of applications and solutions on top of it. We want to make sure that, you know, as Ben said, the, the plumbing for global trade that's dependent on the movement of, you know, physical atoms, uh, the, the underlying bytes, those high fidelity data elements can be shared and moved around systems um, in, in an effective way. Uh, and so, Ben, do you want to elaborate on that point at all? Yeah, absolutely. Right. So whether you have uh, control towers or you have IoT devices, sensors, what have you, essentially what what they're helping is making who when what where more visible right and when i say visible i don't mean visible between two companies or 
two parties or just um, end-to-end -end visible globally, right? So what we have done as part of our, uh, again, we're not uh, building a specific uh, use case or a specific scenario. What we're building is the underlying um, sort of, really there's no other way to describe it, but the plumbing in terms of figuring out this information, who, when, why, what, and where type information. So obviously where would be a location what would be a transaction like a shipment? Um, you know, who would be a party? So, so what we're doing is we're defining uh, standards around those and we're defining in such a way that they're not specific to a specific um, set of parties or specific set of mode or specific set of roles, but in a way that they can be universally used um, across uh, various groups. That is not to say that that work does not exist. Actually, a lot of it exists and it becomes an issue even to figure out which one to use. But yeah. I think we're adding value is looking at that work, whether it exists in UN or whether it exists in, you know, some of the um, earlier standards and so, so forth and trying to see what of it is actually public, shareable, and what of it still remains off-chain in your respective um, ERP systems or control systems, so to speak. So essentially, um, sorry, long answer. Uh, the way we view uh, control uh, tower uh, would be no different than um, a, sen a sensor or a, a party or for that matter. An ERP or a TMS or a WMS or anything like that. Yes, yes. As long as it's any, any of those entities, as long as it's sending data in terms of who and what, where um, type information, and if that information needs to be shared across a, a, a group of participants, not just within an enterprise or within two enterprise, but a, a, a consortium of participants, then, then those are the type of stan standards is what we're building. As far as BIDAS goes, that is not to say that as you, uh, uh, get involved and out of those discussions come up with some real use cases and and subgroups or even private groups are formed and you can go out and implement them using those standards that's that's entirely up to you but we're, we're not doing anything specific solving a specific use case right now other than uh, track and track and, and visibility so so it's really a harmonization if I use that word harmonization of what everything means from a data perspective so that I'm not having to figure it out in my unique situation. Yep. Right. Yeah, I think that's a really good way to say it. You know, the the one of the, you know, when I first started thinking about the application of blockchain technology around supply chain and transportation, you know, the pain point that kept coming up was around EDI communications. And it's great what EDI has enabled in terms of, you know, connecting the world but the unidirectional nature of how that data moves is, is one challenge, but the way that EDI is, you know, uh, has been modified or iterated on over and over and over again for four decades has left, you know, global trade in a translation conundrum. Yeah. And so we, we have this opportunity to bring together other standards bodies that have done great work over the last four years as we've moved towards the digitization of commerce and create these open source and royalty free data standards that are geographic and technology agnostic so that we can you know solve for some of those um, those underlying uh, communication uh, fundamental issues great great so let's let's wrap up here since we're almost at the top of the hour Patrick, Ben, thank you very much for uh, sharing. Folks who have uh, joined live or listened to recording, thank you for joining and uh, listening in. Clearly, there's a lot of great work going on. It sounds like, to my ears here, that on 2021, there's going to be more beyond location uh, coming out of BIDA, and you can actually start using some of that work at the Open API specification uh, in your work, whatever your project is, whether it's a startup or whether it's something within your organization. And I guess the other point I heard was the, the, the work, I'll use harmonization again here, um, the work with the other standards bodies out there so that you don't have to pick and choose and try to make, make uh, 
what seems like a mess into something for yourself because the standard bodies are actually working on that. So with that, happy holidays to everybody. Again, Patrick, Ben, thanks for sharing here and look forward to uh, talking with everybody at our next call, which will be in 2021. Thanks again for joining. Bye. Thank you. All. Thank you. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye, Patrick. Bye, Ben. Bye.